Hello everyone and welcome again to Identity, Vocation and Mission, Week 4, Id Quad Volo. What is my deepest desire? My Id Quad Volo. Hello everyone, welcome back to Identity, Vocation and Mission. I'm Deborah Kent and this is Week 4, Id Quad Volo. This is a familiar phrase among Jesuits and those doing the exercises. What is my id quod volo? What is my deepest desire? The exercises are designed as a journey to understanding, to revelation of my id quod volo. Who am I before God? What am I called to do? What is my mission? What are my deepest desires? We looked last week at the principle and foundation in detail and I'd like now just for a, a short while just to reconsider the principle and foundation if you can't recall it or you're not as familiar with it perhaps you might like just to have a quick read of that before continuing on with the lecture. So in our learning outcomes, we see the term grace, and you'll note that each week I've concentrated on the graces of the spiritual exercises, uh, the bigger graces and the smaller graces that are embedded in the experience and in the text. We know that we need to be attentive to the language that Ignatius uses. There's a, it's a deliberate choice, a deliberate selection of words to convey a truth and an experience and a reality of the journey of the exercises. To rid oneself, we spoke about this last week. The act of ridding oneself cannot be achieved by effort alone. It's not only our will at play here, we also need to be open to the workings of God's grace. So to rid oneself can be achieved only through effort and grace. To rid oneself is a grace. The grace of the foundation is the desire to choose only that which lies at the heart of God's creative action, which is freedom to love. This will manifest itself in our life differently to the way it manifests in another's life. The foundation draws us to find the voice of God in my life. It is therefore as relevant today as it was in the 1500s and in every century in between. The foundation is a prayer to be used by the exitant who is capable of making the full exercise, exercises in either of its forms, either under the 19th annotation, retreat in daily life, or the, the 20th annotation, which is the 30-day experience. It explores dispositions that will later be developed as one moves through the full exercises. We experience the mercy of God in this prayerful experience as recreation which continues long after the journey of the exercises has been concluded. It continues beyond the experience of the exercises. We'll begin this week with our first forum activity. I've posted on ARC a number of selected commentaries on the principle and foundation. Last week, you wrote your own, your own directory. What I'd like you to do is to read these commentaries, these directories that I've posted on ARC, and then rewrite your own commentary in light of these reflections. Compare your second effort to your first. What's changed? What has stayed the same? Share these insights on the forum. This exercise should take you about 30 minutes, but please don't feel confined. If you'd like to spend longer, you have that luxury this week listening to the lecture. You can pause it here and spend some time completing this activity before continuing on with the rest of the lecture. Let's return now to Ignatius's way of forming others. Ignatius's id quod volo, his deepest desire, was to form faithful, generous servants of God. His means for achieving this end with those who sought his help 
and those who wished to join him in his work was a practice of disciplined obedience as a pathway to freedom. It involves choices. The choice to, quote, unite the instrument with God and accommodate it to his hand, especially charity and a pure intention of serving God and familiarity with God in the spiritual exercises of devotion, end quote. That comes from the Constitutions. Ignatius was a prayer. He prayed daily and devoted a generous amount of his time to this activity when he did not advocate extremes in those he formed. He pr actually protested, despite the fact that he himself practiced long prayers, he protested against long prayers. He did believe that one should spend at least an hour or two hours in prayer daily. Ignatius always stressed the quality of prayer though, rather than the time spent praying. Hence, it's never been a custom of the Jesuits, unlike other religious orders, to pray in common. Jesuits are to say their prayers individually. This allows then the active apostolate, someone engaged in an active apostolate, not to cut it short in order to come back and attend prayers, but rather to fit their prayer into their apostolic time. In June 1552, Ignatius wrote about the prayer of the Jesuits, quote, In view of their goal of study, the scholastics cannot have prolonged meditations, but over and above the exercises which they have for the sake of virtue, namely to hear Mass daily, an hour for saying prayers and for the examine of conscience, and confession and communion every eight days, they can exercise themselves in seeking the presence of our Lord in all things, such as their conversations, their walks, all that they see, hear, taste and understand, and in all their actions, since it is true that his divine majesty is in all things by his presence, power and essence. This manner of meditating, which finds God our Lord in all things, is easier than raising ourselves to the consideration of divine things which are more abstract and to which we can make ourselves present only by effort. This good exercise by exciting good dispositions in us will bring great visitations from the Lord, even though they occur in a short prayer. In addition to this, one can frequently offer to God our Lord his studies and the effort they demand, seeing that we undertake them for his love while sacrificing our personal tastes in order that in something we may be of service to his divine majesty by helping those for whom he died. End quote. Ignatian Prayer Prayer was a means to achieving the end of God's service. To achieve the service Ignatius wished for himself and for the Jesuits, it presupposes the helping grace achieved through prayer to union of mind and heart with God. This is not obtained through long protracted prayers, but rather, once the persons had passed through the exercises, they are better able to make choices towards higher good with full freedom. Polanco, in writing to Fernandez, wrote that the quality Ignatius most looks for in candidates seeking admission to the Jesuits is obedience. Ignatius did not admit those who exhibited stubbornness and who upset others, even in small ways. Nor did he admit those who engaged in severe mortifications. Polanco writes, quote, I see that he wishes and esteems those that touch one's sense of honour and self-esteem, rather than those that make the flesh suffer, such as through fasts, disciplines and hair shirts. Perhaps surprisingly for us today, Ignatius used public reprimands and penances often for what we would consider only small infractions. But he always used this method with those whom he had already established a close relationship. However, that didn't stop them feeling the pressure and the discomfort of having their faults and failings corrected in public. 
Lenez, the man who succeeded Ignatius as general, confided that he often felt overwhelmed by Ignatius's rebukes. He wrote, quote, To those who were still children in virtue, Ignatius gave milk, but to those who were more advanced, bread with a crust. While he treated the perfect more rigorously still, in order to make them run full speed towards perfection. Ignatius' system of training was intentional, planned, and always, though, designed, keeping in mind the capacities of the individual. While he could be a severe judge, he could also be a kind father. He dealt severely with his wingmen, such as Polenko and Nadal, and much more gently with those who were not as strong. In the sixth meditation on the two standards is the path for obtaining humility, which strips the individual of self-love, freeing them to be open to learn and grow in the spiritual life. Ignatius' system of training was intentional, planned and always designed, keeping in mind the capacities of each individual. While he could be a severe judge, he could also be a kind father, as was required. He dealt severely with his two wingmen, Polanco and Nadal, and much more gently with those who were not as strong. Ignatius felt that one is able to cooperate more fully with grace when one is able to be humble and open to its workings. And Ignatius had his methods to ensure humility. He stressed a habitual recourse to God through one's day and to be aware of the presence of God in one's work. In the meditation on the two standards is the path for obtaining humility, which strips the individual of self-love freeing them to be open to learning and growth in the spiritual life. As a leader, we know that Ignatius cultivated a close relationship with his men. Gonzales writes, quote, Our father is ever more inclined to love to the point that he seems all love, and thus he is so universally loved by all that we do not see in the society a single person who does not bear him great love and think himself much loved by him in return. End quote. Ignatius was also quick to forget a fault and transgression. He got to know each of his men intimately and was gifted in offering them the correction each needed as much as they could bear. Ignatius at all times was a formator of souls. He strived to remain faithful in transmitting God's message he received himself from God in the grace state of his mystical life. This message was to promote a spirituality of service through love. Ignatius was docile to experience and careful to know his men well and treat them in a way that took full account of their individual differences capacities and needs. He had one goal, better service for the greater glory of his sovereign Lord and Saviour. When Ignatius went to Manresa, he began to think of himself as pilgrim. This is interesting and important for us to note. You don't have to go to the Camino to be a pilgrim. You can become a pilgrim in your own country, in your own circumstances, in your own roles, in your own lives. You can become a pilgrim where you are. It is not the place that makes one a pilgrim, as this event in Ignatius's life shows. Ignatius came to realize that the whole way of living his life was a pilgrimage seeking over the whole of his life to understand God's action and how God was calling him, guiding him, leading him, revealing himself to Ignatius. I, for one, enjoy reading the biographies of the great saints and great people because in one sitting you can draw out the pattern of God's attention in their lives and learn the lessons there between the pages of the covers of the book. 
you don't have to live with someone over 50 years in that way. It's very important, I think, to read biographies, especially of great saints and great people of faith. Hence the importance of the spiritual journal, not only while journeying through the exercises, but each and every day. God continues to work in our lives and one of Ignatius's great lessons is that we need to be attentive to those workings. The pilgrimage is very important to Ignatius, not as a one-off or as a sometimes thing, but as a constant journeying to God and finding God. What holds these diverse elements of the pilgrimage together is the conversation. A spiritual conversation is very important in Ignatian spirituality. This conversation takes to, into account and reveals to me what is important in my life and my love of those things that are truly important. The use of myth a methodical approach to prayer and meditation is a distinguishing trait of Ignatian spirituality. However, Ignatius cannot lay a claim to inventing these spiritual methods. The method of meditation according to the three faculties, memory, intellect and will, was already written of by St Bonaventure in 1274. The method of imaginative contemplation of the events in the life of Christ, we believe, uh, Bonaventure had been influenced by Alred of Reveleau in the 1100s. What Ignatius ingeniously did was package these prayer forms into a revelatory moment. Forum Activity 2. Once again, I'm asking you to pause and to take some time to experience Ignatius's methodology. While we can study the spiritual exercises, it is the experience of them, the experience of these prayer forms, which is the real teacher and from which we will gain the most wisdom. On ARC, there is a single page about how to pray with their imagination using scriptures. So again, I'd ask you to pause for about 30 minutes. Also, you will need a notebook and your Bible. So select any passage in the New Testament and use this to meditate upon over the next 30 minutes. Use the 30 minutes fully for your reflective prayer. Using the sheet as a guide, enter into the passage and note all of the inner movements you feel, both consolation and desolation. Use your notebook book to keep a record of your experience of prayer. When you have finished this reflection, note a few comments on ARC about this style of prayer, its comforts and its discomforts. Did it appeal to you or not appeal to you and why? Pause the lecture here so that you can complete the activity before moving on to the rest of the lecture. The person entering the exercises, having done the preparatory work, is ready to pray. By this time they should have exhibited the skills and discipline to pray in freedom. The structure of the prayer, if followed, frees the person to follow the leadings of the Spirit. Present there should be a sense of wonder and anticipation of the discovery of grace, accompanied as well with contrition. There will be movements of both desolation and consolation. These graces flow out of the consideration of the principle and foundation. It's common, we know, that without knowing sorrow, we can never know fully the feeling of joy. Without knowledge of our sinfulness, we can never quite experience the joy and mercy of God. Although Ignatius believed that this was the easiest week, the first week, 
It is often the experience of the maker of the exercises to find this first week to be the most difficult. For in the first week we do enter into and really face full on the messiness of our life. However, in facing this messiness, in embracing our sinfulness, we are led through this to an awareness of mercy. For a modern take on this entering in and looking back, read now the article by Frankel Donay, which I've posted on ARC. When you've finished reading, please write a response and comment your reactions to this article and share it with your fellow students on the week four forum before continuing on to the next slide. People often wonder about the distinction between meditation and contemplation. One should not be too distracted wondering what type of prayer I'm praying or experiencing at any stage through the exercises. These prayer forms will mingle and morph one into the other throughout the maker's prayer experience. Howard Gray, SJ, distinguishes meditation and contemplation as follows. He says that generally meditation is speaking about ideas, truths and virtues. Contemplation is more about people, interaction, scenes, movements and narratives. All individual prayers will be drawn to the prayer forms that work for them. And throughout our lives, these will often change for us. One prayer form may overtake another as being the most effective in our lives. There's no shying away from the fact that in the first week the focus is on the history of sin, that is the faith history, from the angels through scripture and our participation in it. Paragraph 65 the five senses are involved in the alienation of God as much as in the prayer experience. In the exercises, hell appears as sensory deprivation. The wholeness of who we are is involved in an alienation and later in fulfilment. The dynamics lie in the colloquies. What is a colloquy? Read. 54 in the spiritual exercises text. This appears on page 296 in your textbook. Reading from the book. A colloquy, properly so called, means speaking as one friend speaks with another or a servant with a master. At times asking for some favour at other times accusing oneself of something badly done or telling the other about one's concerns and asking for advice about them. In our third activity, I'm asking you to read 53, 61, 63 and 71. And then write a brief reflection of the grace each of these point to for the exercitant on the week four forum. So read these prayerfully and reflectively and try to, just to uncover what grace is the exercitant being pointed to in these sections of the exercises. It would be good for the students on the forum to engage in Discussion, sharing, please respond to what other students are posting. That way we can have a shared discussion. Please complete this activity before moving on to the next slide. Fifty-three. 
The retreat it holds before them the image of Christ crucified in the midst of his crucifixion. And as in the Gospel of John, with his mother and the beloved disciples standing by the cross, enters into a conversation. As we experienced in our earlier activity with scripture, the role of imagination is very important throughout the journey of the exercises. That way, we do not remain observers, but we become participants in the drama. Time and space must be given to this prayer moment. Look at the questions posed in this colloquy. None of these questions can be ticked off in a few minutes. They're there to draw us deeply into the experience of prayer. These biblical episodes are archetypical myths. They are designed to teach a truth about ourselves, about our wor world and the relationship with our God. They can therefore lead the faithful and those who have not yet come to faith to the discovery of deep truths. Ignatius begins with the mystery of sin as part of our reality looking at heavenly beings, then at men and women like ourselves, all deserving separation, but who were in fact not separated from God because of the sacrifice of his son. The sacrifice of Christ was not in vain, nor was it a wasted action. There is God waiting to save, not condemn. This Christian vision provides us all with the knowledge that our experience of failure, of brokenness, is not absolute. God, looking at my sinfulness, my brokenness, stands waiting to forgive. God runs always towards us. Read the story of the prodigal son, prayerfully, reflectively. Luke 15, 11 to 32 as advised by the Praying Scripture Guide. Note down your thoughts and feelings as you enter into this passage into a notebook or spiritual journal. Then continue with the rest of this lecture. The third and fourth exercises in this first week are far less structured but they will always commence with the preparatory prayer. Read 66 to 70 in the spiritual exercises. Each of these gets you to identify where you need to direct the focus of your prayer. No one can identify this for you. They are intended to guide the maker into a deep prayerful experience. The exercises contain a number of literary devices in the text. One of these, the most obvious one, is the inclusio. Each exercise begins with the retreatant reflecting on what separates you from God and each time you always end with the Lord's Prayer. So you begin with what separates you and you end knowing the intimacy of a loving relationship as a child to the Father, a child of God. You express your intimacy with the Creator as Father. Throughout these exercises we are constantly drawn back from our isolation, from our separation and empowered through the meditations towards the intimacy that a child of God feels. A contemplation. Contemplation exercise now that I'd like you to do is to read Genesis 3 verses 8 to 9 as advised by the Praying with Scripture guide. Enter into this text. Stay with it for as long as you feel you would like to. Once you have finished your meditation, finish it with a slow reflective recitation of the Lord's Prayer. When you have finished it, listen to the link that is included on the slide. It's a Don Francisco song singing about the separation of Adam and the loving call of the Father. Again, at the end, finish this 
songful meditation, musical meditation with the Lord's Prayer. So the exercises today in our contemporary world, we now know there are many, many ways to give the first week of the exercises and there are lots of guides on the market about ways to do this. Probably more people experience the first week of the exercises than the full exercises themselves. The first week have been adapted into a variety of settings, from prisons to schools to retreat centres to families. There is no one right way to give this week to contemporary exodents. Michael Hansen SJ coordinates a program and has a book to explain the process in a contemporary setting. I have included the reference in the supplementary reading section. This is the important role that the giver plays in helping the person to realise the objectives of the exercises. By being attentive to the individual and to their special circumstances in which the journey is undertaken, an experienced guide can ensure that the person is always benefiting from their prayer, meditation and experience of the exercises and never burdened by it. I cannot emphasise enough the importance of having an experienced, wise guide when one embarks upon the exercises. We've already begun to realise that Ignatius paid meticulous attention to the formation of this text, to its structure, the deliberate use of terms, the specific time allocated to each task and so on. But it's also good to remember that while Ignatius was very meticulous, he was never a slave to these prescriptions. The exercises do take a disciplined commitment to reduce the chance of avoidance of difficult realisations about oneself and life. They also respect the ebb and flow of God's activity in the life of the maker and the guide, the giver. This is why they require an experienced guide who can assist in knowing when to adapt the exercises and when not to adapt them to ensure the exercitant is benefiting and not burdened. Ignatius does recommend methods of prayer, but again, he never only offers one method. In the exercises, we have the method of the three faculties, memory, understanding and will. We have contemplation, both imaginative and effective, of the life of Christ. We have an application of the senses, three manners of engaging in prayer. We have the examine of conscience, which is an extremely important prayerful exercise. We have the attentive reading of vocal prayers, the slow recitation of prayer. All of these methods and more assist the exercitant to, as in annotation to, relish things. This is the aim. We want the exercitant to relish the things of God, the things of the Spirit. The nourishing experience of many who make the exercises do experience the relish of things as expressed in annotation too. It is this intimacy with God and the relishing of truth that draws people back time and time again to Ignatian spirituality and the experience of the exercises. Finally, just a quick look at the role of reason and the will in the spiritual exercises journey. Ignatius leads the exercitant with a deliberate method towards the love of Christ in a both effective and a logical process. This participatory action ensures the docility and humility required for a person entering the exercises to be open to the grace of the Holy Spirit and to enter into the mystery of the Godhead. That concludes our session. Just a reminder to have a look at the essay topics. If you would like to modify them or to design one of your own, please just drop me an email. And also remember in week eight to select a tutorial topic that you'll be delivering to the class in a 20 to 30 minute presentation. 
Thank you, and I'll see you next week.